Welcome back to The Mining Pod. On today's show, we're joined by Frank Holmes and Ida Killick to discuss their recent ASIC acquisitions and jump into AI processing. Are you a retail or institutional investor interested in Bitcoin mining companies? The Miner Mag brings you free data and analysis from all major NASDAQ-listed Bitcoin mining operations to know who stands out. Check out visualized metrics and data-dependent stories at theminermag.com. Frank Iden, welcome back to the Mining Pot. It's been a few months, but you guys got some big updates. We're going to get to your May and June mining monthly updates, which were phenomenal. We got to talk about AI, chat GBT, lots of things that you guys are doing. Might be one of the most versatile miners that we've had on the show, but first of all, welcome back. Well, thank you. And it was great uh, meeting you uh, in Miami. I didn't know that uh, you look like a, a center or, or a power forward in basketball. It's all. Appreciate it. Yeah, I, I think I put the camera down like too low or something because I've gotten that <laughs> I comment before. But yeah, there is a lot of me you have to deal with when you meet me in person, I suppose. Well, there's some things we're really excited about uh, and that strategy uh, and to give you more granularity. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk from 50,000 feet and Iden can give you the hardcore detail. Um, but the, the strategy all along was to create these data centers on the assets uh, we were first to go start buying and building those assets. And and, the, and then the other part is with that is the AI, the concept of the AI. So when we bought all those NVIDIA chips, people thought, you know, they're only useful for mining Ethereum, but we didn't like other mining companies did. We bought a higher end chip that allowed us to do machine learning, uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, and I had taken the first uh, uh, AI company public in Canada uh, that was specifically for gold mining. And and it was all the intellectual capital, five PhDs in Montreal. And uh, and it was interesting because I'd been through the exercise. I saw that there's something happening, but I had no idea the CPT chat. But there's something was happening. And uh, so we were going along with this idea that Ethereum goes away, that we'd be able to pivot. And we're, we're doing that. And, uh, and there's some scaling parts that uh, so much blue sky uh, for our chips. Uh, and, and so I let Iden to give you more granularity, but at that stage, uh, then we discovered something, out of the ordinals and I loved it because when I spoke in Miami a couple of years ago, and I said that green Bitcoin, uh, that they're either green and, and they're original Bitcoins, uh, Genesis coins, they're going to become more valuable like Andy Warhol limited art. And a couple of the hardcore Bitcoiners, no, you're crazy. Everything should be fungible. And guess what? After I did that, we got offered a premium 2% for our green coins. But now it shows you that as we get closer to 21 million coins mined, that that they, that that total of those green coins are going to go to trade at a premium. And what validated that for us was what took place with the ordinals and, and that whole journey and I can give you more granularity, but we have 25 cents worth the um, uh, uh, Satoshis and they're worth a quarter million dollars because they are, they're a limited number at a very important inflection point. And so therefore it's showing you that not only 21 million coins are going to create this value chain like, a, like art, uh, it, is, it is going down to 100 million uh, Satoshis per Bitcoin. And if you have those magic numbers, they're extremely valuable. Uh, and the ordinals basically demonstrate it. So if you have a piece of art that becomes unique and you have that unique uh, Satoshi, wow, the, it's unlimited. So I am, I'm very happy at, strategically speaking, at that big picture. But one of the things we also did is that we looked at uh, all the different mining companies have different depreciation and non-cash charges. And some of the audit firms are more aggressive uh, and, and fearful of Bitcoin mining because of the accounting boards going after them. So they're more aggressive at us. So we've pro probably been the most aggressive in taking non-cash charges. So our balance sheet, you know, they basically, Bitcoin, the, the not the Bitcoin, as Bitcoin fell, the cost for buying a chip goes from uh, a Bitmain from $110 a terash down to 10. And we were buying them back in November when FTX blew up. And so we have to write everything down. Like, so all of our machines, everything have to get written down to that level. So, so therefore we've had these bigger non-cash charges 
But as a as when we back out those against our peers and we look at our revenue uh, and our cost of operations and our GNA, we're the most profitable. And that really surprised me that we pr- we produced more last year. Now we see that Marathon and, and Ride are expanding on the top line, but something that we do as original strategy was to function what they call a gold royalty company. And and that is to have high revenue per employee. When we look at, at Hive, uh, last year we did about $6 million per employee, uh, almost almost $7 million. Uh, the year before, more like $12 million. But that still is Goldman Sachs is a million. So we're substantially higher in revenue per employee and that allows us to be that unique business model. And uh, and so with that, I'd like to turn it over to Aiden to give you some more granularity for your listeners that are really into the, the mining uh, industry and, and how we're upgrading and what we're doing. Uh, yeah, so I think it's a really interesting time because everything is moving so quickly right now in, in the Bitcoin mining sector. You're seeing, as Frank mentioned, 30 joule per terahash machines trading as low as when we pick them up 10, 11 bucks a terahash, right? So important to understand the primary variable in your ROI, because we as a public company strive to deliver value to our shareholders, right? If we buy ASICs, we want to repay them and then have them free cash flow, right? It's, it's a lot like the hard rock mining business, right? And so Frank, when Frank talks about cash flow return on invested capital, revenue per employee, right? We want to be able to deliver that value and not just have a company that shows a lot of revenue, but you've raised so much money and and then you layer on a bunch of corporate SGNA and you're you're just kind of peddling, you know, nowhere, right? It's it's very interesting to see how we're at this inflection point and we're mindful of the having event that's coming up in under a year. And so we had a really good quarter, actually two quarters in a row. Our fiscal year end is actually March 31st. And so our year end audit financials are coming out. And so what you're going to notice is all of those numbers are pursuant to April 2022 to March 2023. But all of our peers report with the December 31 year end. So one thing that's really interesting when you look at the calendar year, we actually had the best corporate income in the sector, $55 million. And this is all based on public disclosure. So what you could do is look at the quarter lease for January, December, 2022 for all the big crypto miners. And we had the lowest g in the sector. Our g and for that calendar year was $14.1 million. Most of our peers had 50, 5, 0, 50 million g a on top of their cost of goods sold, right? It's one thing to look at the gross mining margin, but when you actually look at the cost of running the company, that's where things really get tilted. Um, after us, I think the next companies were at $31 million of, of corporate income. And then from there was a steep clip. Some of them were actually, uh, or a few of them, three of them were negative. Um, it's a visual I could circulate. It's going to be in our earnings presentation actually. So look out for it when um, it hits YouTube. And so... But getting back to planning for the future, this is why we did this upgrade to new generation ASICs, right? And it's all it's all map, right? So we look at what is the best ROI. We do sensitivity analysis, and you know, what if we live through another bear market like December? Remember when difficulty finally dropped because Bitcoin hit sixteen thousand five hundred, right? It asphyxiates your mining margins, and if you are not able to control your costs and pivot. For example, we sold power back to the grid in Sweden in December, and we made three point two million dollars just from hedging energy. We're in the head, we're in the energy business, and if you're mining crypto, you don't embrace that. You're going to be a step behind everybody, right? Now, moreover, in this quarter, we also have a new line item on our revenue. It's about a quarter million US, and that was for our GPU as a service, which is our first foray into generating non-crypto mining income from our GPUs. So now our GPUs are doing two things. They're mining altcoins, which we get paid for in Bitcoin. And in addition to that, they're doing high performance computing where we're getting paid about 10 times, 
10x the revenue per kilowatt hour that we get from mining crypto. And if you rewind six months ago, or sorry, I guess, gosh, now it's been nine months since the Ethereum merged, everybody was just like, oh my God, your, the your GPUs are going to turn to stone after the merge. And that's not what happened at all. We immediately, and I mean immediately, pivoted into mining altcoins. And we were doing about 30 grand a day of revenue uh, from our GPU fleet in this and quarter. And I just, I just want to add to that, Aiden. Uh, whenever it gets, Bitcoin gets really volatile, the altcoins make us so much more money. Uh, you just can't believe. And so the AI sort of concept is that you look for the most profitable altcoin. You mine that. It might be for three hours or three days. Yeah. And you're merely converting it to Bitcoin. And, and then that Bitcoin is not a green coin. That Bitcoin is what's sold because uh, we don't want to have that in our balance sheet. And it makes it easier from an accounting point of view because all it is is Bitcoin. Uh, but we sell that. And it's if, if you look at the value per hour per megawatt, as Aiden said, it's very exciting. But it's just, once again, this AI. Yeah, just to go back into the mining thing really quick, and then I want to go back to what I was talking about. You guys did recently announce uh, that you have purchased more machines, the, 30, the less than 30 joules per tier hash machines as well. And then that goes towards your guidance of 6x hash by end of year. So tell me a little bit about that. And then let's square up onto the, the GPU topic as well, which uh, I know our listeners are keenly interested in hearing about. Yeah, definitely. So, you know, we announced in our last big corporate update, our year-end target of 6x a hash. And one thing about Hive, we're very intentional. We're all about executing and delivering, right? So, you know, we don't go out there and say we're going to be at, you know, 33x a hash next summer. Like, we put out a number that we know we are going to be able to, with our capital, you know, we announce a, a, an ATM, we look at our balance sheet, and we say, okay, what is, what is a number that we believe we're going to be able to actually realize. And so there's different ways to to go about expanding, right? And we also have a fleet of ASICs that we want to upgrade. And so we want to bring our global efficiency of all of our ASICs and improve it. So if you have a 38 joule per terahash Canaan, right? Which was once upon a time was like the newest and best machine, right? Once upon a time. Um, but now you've got S19 Pro Plus, Right, which is 27 joules of terahash, or an XP, which is 22 joules of terahash, and you do a like for like upgrade, you're actually getting a substantive increase to within your existing floor plate. Right, so we we look at all of these things, and and that's why we bought that 1.2 exahash of A6, and that's to get us from three to four in an accretive manner. And so as we strive towards the six exahash for the balance of the year, you know we'll be making. The, the requisite announcements, but everything is done with intention. We study the the analytics. We want to make sure that these repay themselves. The Ace, the S19 Pros that we announced, uh, J Pros that we announced in Dece November and December, they're already half paid off, right? And keep in mind, that was coming out of some of the worst mining economics we've, we've seen, right? But they were quick delivery. They were fire sale prices. We had the rack space to plug them in immediately. We don't buy machines just to warehouse them, which don't generate cash flow. We want them making cash flow return on invested capital. I know it's a mouthful, but it's a very, very important, it's, it's our Bible, right? That's sort of the the landscape for the ASICs. And, you know, we we have um, uh, some, we're, we're constantly looking at offers and we'll pro provide a press release once we've got, you know, a good amount. We don't want to sort of inundate the market with, uh, you know, all of the minutia because, because we're very analytical at high, we want to just give, you know, a good milestone update from time to time. Uh, but you know, we are actually going to be at four X a hash, um, in about a month from now, uh, we're at 3.6 right now, uh, including our GPU fleet. So we're producing, um, almost nine Bitcoin a day. Uh, and as Frank mentioned, uh, about 0 0.4 of that is from our uh, GPUs and and those get those get sold immediately. So if we come out and we say we have two thousand Bitcoin on the balance sheet, that's self mined green energy Bitcoin. Now, before you go to the the GPU conversation, there's one other thing too, which is really exciting, and that's the uncommon Sats. So we have two hundred and fifty uncommon Sats. 
So we mined over 300 Bitcoin in May, I believe it was 304.6. And at the time, we also had a review of our, our HODL position. So we had 250 uncommon sats. So we have found there's immense demand for these. And we, we mentioned in our last press release, so we'll provide more specifics on that in the near future. But there is, I, I mean, orders of magnitude in terms of the value that people are ascribing to these, these uncommon sats. And to transact with specific sats, it's, it's more complicated than just doing a standard um, Bitcoin transaction, right? You have to specify your own UTXO. And so this is where our technology team comes in. And, you know, we work directly with our custody provider. We're writing code. We're dealing with APIs. And so it's all of this deeper layer of operations that you have to figure out when you want to be first to market with something, right? To, to my awareness, no other miner has come out and talked about their, the uncommon sets that they have. Uh, and we've already found a buyer for all of them. We're not going to sell all of them, but we're going to sell, we're going to sell some of them. So that's very exciting as well. There's uh there's some, there's some other fun things. I, I'm sure Frank has been in the past, the greenhouse project in Sweden that's coming along swimmingly. I had a very interesting stat. Um, let me pull it up for you actually, because we were looking at the impact because we want to be carbon negative where possible. Uh, and so when you look at the amount of gas, greenhouse gas that would be offset, I've got this figure here for you. The greenhouse that we're building in Sweden would convert to the energy savings from our Bitcoin mine would convert to 380,000 cubic meters of natural gas that's safe or it avoids 676,000 kilograms of CO2 from going into the atmosphere, right? And so this that data comes from our thermal engineer who's doing all the heat transfer stuff, right? So that's super exciting. We're already doing the heat recapture in La Chute. Um, so that's all of that stuff we talked about is just on the ASIC mine, uh, ASIC and, mining. And and what's cool about La Chute, I just came from there. I wanted to explain, it, it, it's, it's we heat this this uh, like an oil and it goes across in a pipe and it's like a radiator the old days when you had steam water radiators uh we heated building five times our size uh in the winter which has 175 workers making whirlpools um and and what is that liquid uh i didn't oh they're using call uh glycol yeah so there is interest basically um, a heat exchange system so the buildings are are adjacent to each other. I mean, you know, there's there's maybe, 25 yards from each other. Yeah, yeah. And so um there's there's a system whereby the heat from all of our air cooled machines is captured, uh, built through a heat exchanger. And that I mean, I don't want to explain to everyone. Let let everybody else figure out how it works. But let's just say we figured out in a very novel way that our industrial neighbor is very grateful for because as you know, right, Quebec, it's very cold in the winter. And so we are heating a 200,000 square foot manufacturing wow. uh, facility with the heat from our Bitcoin mine, right? And again, what does that impart? Carbon negative, because now they don't have to buy power from the grid. Although hydro in Quebec is, is uh, sorry, power in Quebec is hydro, but at least it, it um, offsets. You, could, the, the you could say we're creating a credit. Yeah. No. I mean, you got a lot going on there, like ASIC purchases, ordinal theory, and then the heat exchange there. Let's go into the GPU stuff for, I guess, the fourth interesting topic. You mentioned the Ethereum mining, which I was just pulling up some of our own numbers uh, from Mining Memo and Anthony Power, who does a great job looking at you guys every month. And as of September, when the merge happened, which was mid-month, you guys yep. had mined 1,400 or so Ethereum. And then, of course, you moved those GPUs over to mine altcoins, which were then converted into Bitcoin. And a lot of people at the time were like, oh, no, like, what's Hive going to do? You guys didn't have to wait very long for Chad GBT to pop up. And now you're in a great position for another uh, diversified stream of revenue. Tell me about this on a, on a larger scale, what you guys are thinking about with this, and also how your fleet of pre-existing ASICs was, or it, not ASICs, excuse me, GPUs was able to move into this uh quickly growing market for compute demand. The GPUs were actually purchased in, or ordered, I should say, in summer of 2021. And so that was a $66 million investment. 
to allow for us to have income from Ethereum mining and a life thereafter. And so these are NVIDIA data center grade GPUs. And it's very important to note that because a lot of the Ethereum miners were using retail or gaming grade uh, GPUs, which were fine for their purpose, right? Because the nice thing about mining Ethereum, it was super decentralized. There's a lot of hobby miners, right? One of our, our um, employees in New Brunswick, he put himself through college mining Ethereum on his laptop, you know? And, and so it was very much this, this community of, whereas Bitcoin mining got very industrialized. Now, that being said, we had purchased data center grade GPUs. You know, we're talking 24 gigabytes of RAM, you know, massive, massive resources. So A40s, A6000s, A5000s, and A4000s. So 38,000 GPU cards. And so what's, what's happening, as I mentioned, there's a new line item on our revenue uh, for this quarter uh, period on March 31st. And that is from our GPUs as service. And so these are GPUs that are being rented out for a few hours or a few days, and people are running AI compute loads. We call that GPU as a service. In addition to that, over a year ago, we started building Hive Cloud. And Hive Cloud is our private enterprise cloud service. And so this will allow a business to come on and have a large assortment of GPUs, right? and run whatever sort of compute they need. Now, what is very remarkable about this is that although there's large language models that are public, if you upload something to OpenAI, you have, you're, you're basically you know forfeiting your privacy or your ownership of your data. I mean, sure, you still have, but guess what? Now they have it. And whatever processing and output that they've done based on your data is also theirs. It's a lot like uploading your photos to Facebook in 2012 and now, you know, Mark Zuckerberg has them forever. And so maybe at an individual hobby level, people, you know, don't mind as much. You know, they're saying, hey, open AI, write me Cinderella, uh, you know, but in a Harry Potter style or whatever. Like that's just fanciful nonsense. But if you're actually a company and you have client data that you want to run through an AI algorithm, well, there's hesitation there. There's issues there with privacy of data. With a private enterprise cloud, what we could do is we can train a large language model with our GPs because training LLMs is incredibly resource intensive, incredibly, like we're talking, it can take months and thousands of GPUs to train an LLM, a large language model. And, and so if just, just for the readers out there, I know this is more of a Bitcoin mining podcast. When you talk about a large language model, this is what uh, chat GPT operates on, right? So G a GPT is, is actually a generative pre-trained transformer, right? So it's it's basically um, an AI process whereby this massive bank of data, for example, GPT-4 is a trillion parameters, right? That this thing has, has studied and has developed this intelligence on. So when you query it, when you ask it to say, you know, tell me about Harry Potter, what it's done is it's already studied this, this trillion parameters, but I mean, that data covers so many things. And so what it does is it uses probability to look at the input string you've provided and say, okay, this is what the output is. Now, when you ping it, that's called an inference, right? So there's two things. There's training the large language model, which takes a huge amount of computing power. But once you've done that and you want to ping it and get an answer, that's called an inference and that's much easier, right? Um, but we can allow for both of those on, on high cloud where a, a company can sign an SLA, have privacy ownership of their data, et cetera. And that's very key. You know, I've been doing a lot of traveling lately and meeting with startups that are in AI and, and even larger companies. And we've found that this is a very consistent theme. So we're excited to launch Hive Cloud later this year. And we're doing beta testing right now and we're with a few companies to look so through all. The part, as we started with, is a B2B model. And, and there are other service providers that do all the AML and KYC and people go through them, they scrape off 25%, but they take care of all that so that we just have to manage that one relationship. And they're looking for these uh, these the chips and they pay you 40 cents, 70 cents, a dollar per hour for using those machines. And so we're, we're happy it's throwing off basically free cash flow. But if you look at the fleet, and I didn't correct me if I've got this wrong, but we have about 38,000 of these these unique, very powerful chips. 
And when and what we're doing is trying to fast track super micro uh, uh, servers, and it's going to need a, almost four thousand of these servers. It's almost like ten for one. So we're going to need thirty eight hundred of them. Uh, and we have we have some on on in motion now, and they're working and functioning. That's just throwing off the revenue. But if we put them all on those servers today, and based on seventy five percent, we try to give you the blue sky potential opportunity. It's like two hundred and fifty million in revenue. I mean, this is a this is like another re, uh, Ethereum high gross margin business because what we want to do is compare. Uh, what, how, what's the revenue we're making from Bitcoin mining per hour minus the cost of running that? And then you compare that to what AI, the demands for AI, uh, is, is much more profitable. And we're still a third of the cost of AWS or, um, or Microsoft. So we are offering a great product for uh, server people that need access to these chips. Um, so, and we built the beta site works. It makes money. We're very happy with it. And now as these super micro uh, servers come in, and they, I guess the first big order is coming in next month, Aiden? It's yes, time. we have actually uh, super micro. So the super micro servers, that's where you've got your CPU, your VRAM, all of the other constituent requirements for doing high-performance computing that the, the GPUs bolt into, right? And so we've got an order arriving next week in Sweden. We're running this all out of Sweden, by the way. And so uh, another order arriving in August. And so as more and more of these servers land, then the GPUs that are doing altcoin mining can then be repurposed for doing AI because it just um, unleashes their full potential. And so because we once, believe, yeah. Once you're on those servers, then you can always go back easily to mining altcoins. But right now we can't easily go the other side. We need these powerful servers, and and uh, we had another service uh, system, but it wasn't working to what we needed. So, well, that's like I said, we perfected what we want to have. So we're in motion now. We're scaling, uh, and, and and the numbers like it just shocks you. If you put all the thirty eight thousand GPUs to work tomorrow, they would consume only seven megawatts of electricity. Is that correct, Aiden? Yeah. Yeah. I, and it would throw up over 250 million in revenue. That's the potential. And you have, you're going to make about 200 million. So now how much do we get? Do we get half of that? What, how's the scale will be? And so far we've shown a good track record of building data centers and scaling uh, in a very orderly way. So I think we can do this again. Um, but it's very exciting for, for Hive because we have alternative sources then that becomes so profitable allows us to quickly expand from cash flow our bitcoin operation love it yeah aiden uh, i did say something earlier that i really like and he said this is a bitcoin mining podcast and i think something that's important about this is this is another ancillary service for bitcoin miners right like we talk about energy all the time we talk about machine services all the time and there's lots of things on that side of the scope but now we have another one right and, and there's people like yourselves who are at the right place at the right time mining theorem we're able to successfully transfer over you guys have to go in a minute, so I only have time for one more question, and then we'll have to do another podcast in the future talking specifically only about what you guys are doing with GPUs. But the last question for the show is basically comparing these two models and how you guys see them going forward. Is there a future where AI is so profitable that it would make more sense to to pivot entirely in that direction? Or at this time, do you see it as more of a bubble phenomenon? The prices will go down. These will be complementary services to work together. I'll speculate that I think that the difficulty hash rate rising is like when you buy these GPU chips, they're going down uh, in which you get revenue per year, per hour. So you have to realize like there you've got these two stress points. But what's exciting is the ordinals and this is for Bitcoin. And uh, and so how you position yourself in that space is, as I think is just huge. And, and the Bitcoin uh, network and lightning um, we're, we're, we're deploying money into that interest because we believe the lightning network is very critical for the expansion and adoption of Bitcoin. Uh, and the more revenue, what we did from Ethereum is that we, we basically expanded two exahash, uh, on, on the hive without big dilution, without borrowing money. 
other companies got into all kinds of problems. We didn't take those risks. Uh, we basically milked the cow of Ethereum with 90% gross margins and kept buying more machines, uh, Bitcoin machines. So I hope that it works out uh, the same way that the AI will allow us to continue in building out uh, the Bitcoin network. Love that. I didn't any final thoughts on that before we close out shop? Yeah, I think from uh, your vantage as, as a podcaster that looks at Bitcoin mining, but also energy economics, and compute power from AI application, it all kind of falls under Web3, right? And so these are all pillars like AI, cryptocurrencies, DAOs, they're all they're all pillars of Web3. And so now with the advent of ordinals and inscriptions, you now have information on the Bitcoin blockchain, which is remarkable, right? That's an inflection point in how Bitcoin can contribute to the Web3 ecosystem. And so we are constantly, as, as a technology company, doing R&D, seeing how we can add value to these ecosystems and whether it's, you know, on the energy supply chain, uh, working with utilities and doing grid balancing, whether it's um, wanting to, we want to be the first people, the first public crypto miner that's transacting specific sets, right? And, and demonstrate the ability to do that and all the controls and processes, um, obviously, We've been experimenting with GPUs for some time, and it's a very exciting time because as we have all of this, like, there's so much R&D happening in the background, right? When it, it's exciting to say, okay, well, here's something, let's let's go live this, let's just share this with the public, right? So it's going to be an incredibly interesting year ahead for Hive, and um, I think I would say just stay tuned. Love it. Thank you both so much for your time. Look forward to talking to you guys again in the future about GPU models. We'll let you both go. Have a great time on your next call. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you, my friend. Bye.